what do the available data points really tell us about murder in 21st century America and about the effectiveness and impact of criminal justice reforms? Joining me now to try and answer that question are Samuel Sinyongwe, co-founder of the police reform movement Campaign Zero and contributor to the Pod Save the People podcast, and Rafael Mongual, senior fellow and deputy director of legal policy at the conservative Manhattan Institute. Uh, Sam, Raphael, thank you both for joining me tonight. Sam, let me start with you. Let me play you what Senator Lindsey Graham said this afternoon about the root causes of violent crime. Have a listen. The reason that the spike in crime is nobody's getting prosecuted when they go into Walmart and clean the place out. The people who robbed and looted in New York are being let go. There's a sense out there that the bail system is broken down. You get caught on Monday morning, you're out on Monday afternoon. And the FBI director said today, about 30 minutes ago, it's the hardest time that he can ever remember being a police officer. Conservatives like him, Sam, argue that the social justice movement has effectively lowered the transaction cost of criminal activity, made cops hesitant to engage in proactive policing. You don't agree, I'm guessing. No, I think if that were true, we would be seeing increases in crime that were limited to the places that made those changes. Uh, and instead of that, we're seeing across the board increases in murder specifically, not in crime overall, not in violent crime, as you mentioned earlier, in murder specifically all across the country. And those increases preceded uh, the protests in June. Uh, so we were seeing increases in March, uh, in April of last year, in the beginning of the lockdowns. We're even seeing some increases uh, before many of the lockdowns were underway. Um, so if this was a narrative that was, uh, or a, a problem that was being driven by protests, uh, by uh, police feeling pressure uh, and changing their practices, we would see it limited to the places that actually did that. As you described, very few, if any places, actually defunded the police. Uh, in most places, police budgets are almost the same as they were last year, which is a historic high. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't have to do with you know the, this question of the police de-policing or being defunded. That's not what happened. What we are seeing is increases all across the country, regardless of which strategy they took with regard to policing. Rafael, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I'm not sure that's exactly right. I mean, generally speaking, homicides are, are extremely concentrated in across the United States over the course of history. I mean, generally, in any given year, about about two percent of U.S. counties see about fifty-one percent of U.S. murders. I did not see any indication that that level of crime concentration changed in 2020. It would seem to me that uh, the, the rise in homicides was not a countrywide phenomenon. Um, I, I, I also think. There's a lot more to the idea that a police pullback might have been feeding this. Uh, we do see in some cities like New York a, a real spike uh, in, in crime that followed the, uh, the, the protests in, in late May and early June. Uh, I think you see that in other cities as well. I also uh, you know, can't really think of any cities that saw significant crime increases that did not engage in some kind of uh, reform effort on, on one level or another. But in the end, I think it's also kind Raphael. of silly to compare some of these cities with one another. Can I jump in? Can I jump? Sure. Go on. Sorry, make your point and then I'll jump in. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say that not every city is going to be as vulnerable to a crime increase in response to a change in criminal justice policy as any other. So it, it might take more or less to, to undo uh, you know, the progress that's been made on the public safety front in one city compared to another. So I'm not sure these comparisons hold all that much water. Rafael. We have, a, we have a graphic I want to put up from Fort Worth, Texas. You look at Fort Worth, Texas, it's been Republican-led for a decade. Uh, in 2020, it had 100 murders for the first time in a quarter century. Likewise, in Lexington, Kentucky, Omaha, Nebraska, Miami, in Jacksonville, Florida, where the mayor is the former state Republican Party chair. These are all GOP-run cities in solid red states. How does that fit with what you're saying? Yeah, I, I don't think, uh, you know, that, that a city by the GOP necessarily makes it immune from the momentum of the criminal justice reform movement and the police reform movement. Uh, you know, the last year, the New York Times just recently reported that 30 states have passed over 140 different police and criminal justice reform. That's just uh, in the last 365 days. I don't think red jurisdictions have been immune from that trend. A lot of red cities are located in blue states. But, I, you know, honestly, I, I don't think that looking at this as a a political uh, you know, issue is, is all that productive. So, so I, I would reject that framing uh, regardless of who brings it to the table. I mean, there have been okay. plenty of blue cities that have gotten it right 
uh, on the criminal justice front. And New York and L.A. Okay. are perfect examples of that. I mean, they really overcame crime in the 1990s and early 2000s. Okay. We've also seen red cities get it wrong. So just to I be clear, the cities I all cited were red movie. cities. Hold, hold up. I will. I will, Sam. One second. I just want to make one point clear, just for our viewers. The cities I cited, Raphael, were all red cities in red states. But, Sam, come back in. Sure. Yeah, so, you know, there's been this, this argument that it's only, you know, blue cities or red cities in blue states, um, and that this is somehow limited to, you know, uh, reform-minded politicians, prosecutors that have somehow driven up the crime rates. That's not what we're seeing. In fact, um, you look at Baltimore with state's attorney Mosby, who has been implementing reforms as a, as a prosecutor. Um, that was one of the few cities that didn't see a, a spike in crime relative to last year. Um, St. Louis, uh, another example. So again, I think, you know, this isn't something that you can paint with, uh, you know, it's a blue city issue or a red city if they're in a blue okay. state issue. Again, as I said, this is happening all across the country in red cities, in blue cities. It has a lot to do with the Sam, pandemic, let me with ask gun you, purchases, not so much about the protests. Let me ask you about the pandemic, Sam. You just mentioned the pandemic. That is one of the main reasons offered by a lot of experts say, no, it's not about politics, it's about the pandemic. How do you explain the fact then that a lot of countries, a lot of countries, all countries, went through the pandemic, but all of them haven't seen the same kind of murder rises that the United States has? So you explain it because the United States makes it uniquely easy for people to translate their frustrations, their anger into violent, even deadly uh, crime through the use of guns. It's easier to get a gun in the United States than almost anywhere else. Uh, we saw gun purchases, as, as you mentioned, at historic highs in 2020, and it looks that they've increased even further so far this year. Um, so you have situations where more people are now armed. Um, even data, recent data that was published by uh, Rob Arthur and Jeff Asher, some data scientists and criminologists, looking at uh, cities that had seen uh, reductions in uh, stops by the police, what they also noted was in those cities in the beginning of the pandemic, as there were fewer people outside, fewer stops being made, more people were still being found with guns on the streets than in previous years. So more people uh, were possessing arms, went out and bought new guns. Um, that's why you're seeing in the United States, the frustration, the anger isn't unique to the US. Um, the economic issues okay. and inequality um, aren't unique here, yeah. but the level of access to firearms is, and that's what you're seeing uh, translate so, into not only fatal violence, so, but also uh, non-fatal shootings as well. So let's pick up on that point, Raphael, that Sam made. You've criticized this idea that the pandemic itself is responsible for higher murder rates. In a recent column for The Hill, uh, you write, the pandemic was global in its impact, but the jump in criminal homicides was not, which I think is a fair point. But as Sam points out, the crime problem is more American than global, but then so is our gun problem. That's more American than global too. Why ignore 40 million guns sold last year in America? There were not 40 million guns or even 4 million guns sold in France or Germany or Belgium or Canada. Sure. Um, I mean, one really good reason to ignore that is that the research generally shows that there is a long lag time that a gun is involved in a crime. So talking about... New York City, for example, gun crime, uh, uh, crime guns, these are guns recovered at crime scenes, tend to be recovered uh, on average three years after their initial legal purchase. So it's not a, an obvious causal mechanism that would link the recent purchase of all these firearms to the increase in these crimes. Um, so so that's, that's one argument. The, the, the second point that I would make is that there are plenty of other countries that, again, did not see serious rise in um, problems in the United States. I would point to Mexico. Uh, uh, Brazil. Um, okay. It, it just it does seem water. The piece that 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 Jeff Asher uh, oh, with Holly, I do think it's interesting to note. But one of the questions that I think it leaves unanswered is what was feeding the demand for these new guns, and wouldn't that actually be the cause of the homicide increase, and not just the presence of guns themselves, unless you think they have some talismanic value. Uh, or, 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 you know, a sort of aspect to them that, that would take someone who's, a, you know, an otherwise law-abiding citizen and turn them into a it's, it's It's a... It's a fair question about demand, but as I say, the supply is a uniquely American problem. But I appreciate you both coming on, uh, Sam Raphael, to debate this. The debate will go on and on. We appreciate your insights tonight, both of you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.